This is uh, what I did on my summer vacation <laughs> with my dog Cora. I took her on a walk along this path. This is a vintage map of Translast Pipeline and all the pump stations. and some towns along the way. Don't look for them now. You won't see uh, Lupin anymore. You won't find Crazy Horse. Anybody know where Crazy Horse is? Uh, no. huh? Never heard of that one. Huh? So this is a path I chose to hike. I hiked it 20 years ago, and I hiked it this year. And here is your course profile for all you runners. <laughs> And a lot of people ask me, say, Ned, why don't you bike the pipeline? And this is my evidence right here. Look between uh, China River and Yukon River. And I contend that that is unbikeable. Maybe by Jeff and Heather. And they can try it, but I think uh, they'd be doing a lot of pushing and a lot of technical breaking going downhill. So there you go. It's 800 miles. It's from the uh, Valdez. Terminal Port Valdez, Gulf of Alaska to the Arctic Ocean and the Beaufort Sea. Why would anyone want to hike a pipeline? Huh? Seems like a uh, kind of a weird thing to do, right? It's not quite wilderness. It's not quite all industrial, but it's a combination of the two. You take a seat, young man. <laughs> Well, I want to do it because there's a road alongside it, the whole way, all 800 miles. There is a parallel gravel road that nobody drives. Only like, uh, they do maintenance on the pipeline, they do a lot of maintenance on it. So those guys drive it in areas, but they never go more than 20 miles an hour. So it's a great place for a dog, because you never have to keep a dog on a leash. So for about 420 miles, the pipeline is above ground. And for 380, it is below ground, but you still get that great path. And I loved it. It was like my own uh, Appalachian Trail. You get beyond those gates, you see nobody. Nobody. Nobody uh, under human power. If you did, you knew you knew them. They would come to see you. <laughs> so, I got this... Uh, letter of non-objection. I still got it in my pocket. And anybody could get, get one. You all could get one and uh, do stuff on the pipeline pad. It's really easy if you do non-motorized stuff. If you say, I want to hold a motorcycle race, it's probably going to get tied up for a while. But if you're just going to walk, I'll give you a permit. And I always tried to uh, not camp right on the pipe if I could help it. Sometimes I couldn't help it. Um, but that's a nice campsite up in the Brooks Range. That's a really nice campsite up in the Brooks Range. That's Eric Troyer camped right underneath the pipeline <laughs> on the North Slope. Because sometimes that's the best place, especially up there where it's all soupy and uh, watery and tundry and not a flat spot for your tent. And certainly not a flat dry spot for your tent. Okay, let's go back, take you back in time. Who here wasn't alive in 1997? <laughs> wow, raise your hands, huh? That's quite a reason for this guy. The rest of us were around, and we remember all these things. <laughs> some of which are still here now, some of which are not. Uh, that's me in 1997. I had this great dog. Her name was Jane. She was Labrador Retriever. And she was the reason I wanted to do that first trip. I'm going to take a great dog on a great walk. And I did. And I wrote this book. 
it's still in print. Uh, publisher just went out of business, sort of. And I thought, oh great, I get the rights back. So I called them the other day and said, no, it's still in print. We're going to make an announcement in a few days, so I think they're still alive somehow. So it's still sort of available, which is good. When you're there, right? Okay, back to our path. There, there we are. I started in the south in Valdez and I went northward. It's a fairly straight line. LAS pipeline says 800 miles long. Um, that's probably accurate. My GPS said 850 when I was done because I walked around stuff a lot. Um, I didn't stay on the pipe the whole time. Started uh, when it was wintry in Valdez, April 30th, and just finished. August 9th. Here's some buddies I started with. Ian Carlson. He's wearing the red hat there. Chris Carlson. He's standing right um, back there filming me. Um, those guys are my neighbors, my, my wiffle ball buddies, my softball buddies. That white uh, poodle type labradoodle is Cora's best friend, so she came along. And as you can see, it's still pretty wintry down there in April. In fact, there was a lot of snow there, and it was raining on top of the snow. So that was our first campsite. We just found one spot, our whole day of hiking, that didn't have snow on it. It's right above the pipeline. So we got our start. So as everyone knows, work makes one free. And I worked for 20 years plus at this place, the Geophysical Institute. And I did a little work when I was walking 20 years ago, and I did a little work when I was walking this time. I got paid half time to write newspaper columns. Uh, 20 years ago, there is an official print copy in the news liner. And 2017, there is a screenshot of the Alaska Dispatch News, which is still live. Yay. I didn't know it was going to be like yesterday. So I wrote columns for them in every week, sent them back when I could. I brought an iPad along and some other things that were a little bit heavy. But I found, boy, very rarely was I somewhere where I had Wi-Fi. So uh, I couldn't send very often. It was also quite nice. <laughs> Uh, one of those columns I wrote was about how my load seemed to be a lot lighter in 2017 than it was in 1997. There is a picture of my early pack in 1997. Tent on top, sleeping bag on bottom, little guy on there. Uh, at times I would carry like seven days of food back then. And it was over 70 pounds at one point. That's a heavy pack. Quite heavy indeed. This year, my friend Jay recommended I get a lighter pack, and I did. There is our friend Norma wearing my pack. As you can see, it's very slender and uh, it's very light. Probably weighs about two pounds or so, if that. One thing I had this year, also, that I didn't have 20 years ago, was this nifty little device. I bought it right before I left, it's about $450 at REI, because they just come out with a new model. This is a handheld, fits in my pocket. It was a GPS, so it had maps, color maps on it. Not that you need them on the pipeline, right? You always know where you are. <laughs> but they told me where water was coming up kind of where I was. Um, but it had text. I could text anyone at any time because it goes through satellites. 20,000 miles up, 22,000 down. And uh, and very reliable. My friend Susan Sharbaugh, she lives in Michigan. She's a big Seattle Mariners fan. So she took on the important responsibility of giving me Yankees, Mariners, and Red Sox scored every night. <laughs> it was fantastic. I'd be in the tent, it'd be late, you know, it'd be a night game out on the West Coast, and just be my sleeping bag, wait for the amber light to come on, and I'd see your message. And I'd be either happy or sad, or very happy. I think the Yankees won the Red Sox lost. Uh, plus, this deal also would give me a 
three day weather forecast that was it was pretty good it was uh, somewhat accurate there you can see in the beginning you see one of my low temperatures at 4 a.m. on Friday it was 21 degrees so I had a big sweep back there more technology changes this is 1997 that is a uh, Sevi Lower trail boat it was one of the first sponsors I got for the first pipeline tank to manufacture these rafts which are kind of like beach toys he gave to them I sold them to Mark Ross for 50 bucks a piece years later <laughs> he liked them because they're really light but um, you wouldn't want to hit any rocks with them like Mark did <laughs> he played really fast <laughs> So this year, because we have this wonderful product that has developed since 1997, this is the alpaca wrap, which a lot of you are familiar with, and it's uh, it's awesome. It's about the size of a loaf of bread. It's really light, and uh, I used it for some river crossings. This is the Salter River, which is you can't walk a highway bridge around, which is often an option along the pipeline route because it's 12 miles from the road and the pipeline goes underneath the south so you either had to swim or float or 20 years ago I got a boat ride and just fly down the guy, which would have worked this time too this time I used a raft so big differences between 97 and 2017 <laughs> where'd all the people go dude there's just uh like a lot less people on the line. 20 years ago, I met a lot of maintenance workers, I met a lot of Alaskans. And this time I was missing them, especially like in the uh, Copper River Valley. It seemed like a lot of people have moved out from the, at least along the pipeline there. A lot more people were doing stuff along the pipeline, but now it's, uh, it's quieter. Plus there was a lot more pipeline workers. LES Pipeline Service Company has had a great workforce reduction because uh, same reason Alaska has had a great workforce reduction because oil prices are a lot lower. Uh, this is 20 years ago, Pump Station 3, a lady with a paper in her hand. And she was assigned to sort of uh, take care of me that day. Um, but by the time I got up to Pump 3 20 years ago, they knew what I was doing and they were they would let me in every pump station. I've had meals. i take a shower there, chat with people. Uh, but this year, yeah, they really uh, I walked up to pump station 12, and it's like, yeah, some abandoned Mars colony, you know? <laughs> this is the personal living quarters. And, and there's nobody there. And me and Eric Troy were up at pump station, too. And there was not a single person in that pump station. Which is hard to believe. So I didn't have that close Alaska connection that I had in Pipeline Trip 1. In fact, there was nobody around at all a lot of the time. But who would say that's bad, right? Most Alaskans, you say population's going down. It's right on, man. That's why I'm here. <laughs> These people to Portland or whatever. So the wildlife is creeping back in. Never left, really. What species of owl is that? Bird people, it's a baby. It's hard to tell, it's really big. This is a, uh, who said? Great horn, very good. It doesn't have ear tufts yet. Clinging uh, tenuously to the pipeline, those little guys, they're so funny. They would try to perch on a circular part and they'd slide right out. <laughs> This is my farthest north wood frog. Yeah. Saw him well north of the Arctic Circle. I don't think it was a record far north because it was it was just south of Coldfoot. But you figure it's pretty far north. Pretty cold up there right now. Good for you, frog. There is an adult, great horned. My nephew would come up. And he and his mom and his brother were up visiting. We were up just shy of the Arctic Circle. And it was a beautiful summer night right around Solstice. And he said, I want to see a caribou. 
And I said, well, let's go for a walk. I was pretty tired after the day, but let's go out. And we all did. My friend John was with me. And I thought, no way we're going to see a caribou. There it was. John saw him far in the horizon. A little pain up over there. Yeah, what is that? A little bunny? She's right. Where's Anna Roselle? She's still back there? Sleeper. Sleeper. <laughs> it's not good. Anna saw this. She spotted it. The girl's got an eagle eye. This guy was easy to spot. Flushed him right up here. So it was cool because I had the uh, all stages of bird like this year. The migration coming in. Had the little babies like this guy. Saw them turn into adults. Cora chased every one of them. <laughs> this is an osprey with a huge nest out in Shaw Creek Flats. This is Tina Turner, you all know her. <laughs> so my dog turned out to be pretty good these guys. Uh, she just barked at this one, as I recall, and did not chase it. Uh, remember her buddy, the poodle? The labradoodle? Yeah, that was our first couple days. They would go off, you know, when they weren't threatening our ACLs by fighting each other, coming right into our legs. They were <laughs> off in the bushes somewhere. and. Uh, came back and me and Ian saw her. So what's that sticking out of her mouth? So she just got one quilt. But it took me, Chris, and Ian holding this dog to get that one quilt out. And Cora was sitting there watching. And I think she learned. Because <laughs> we never got into one. So this right here is my favorite part of hiking the whole pipeline was being there get my water from a little ditch or a little rivulet that crossed the gravel road and you either steri petting it or you're eating and there's the yellow horn right there. You don't even need binoculars. You know, they're all kind of migrating in and songs. Just being out there all the time. Just living out there. And I uh, had a lot of nice small animal encounters like this. Did not have many big animal encounters. Saw a lot of fresh tracks, but not a lot of fresh bears. There was one creature, though, that we saw a lot more this summer than I saw 20 years ago. I'm not sure why. It's this moose fly. They're in the horsefly family. In fact, they're called horseflies, but I like calling them moose flies up here. And they really like me. Some people, Eric, they don't bite very much, but uh, me, they like, and they don't, uh, they're not like a mosquito that punctures you with a hypodermic needle and pulls it out. These guys got cutting mouth parts. It's like two, uh, two box cutting knives that, that they pull sideways, and uh, what they want to do is make a hole in you and then lap up the blood. Um, so we saw a lot of those, because we had a lot of 83 days. Speaking of weather, you live outside for 96 days, you see it all. You see it all. Here's my, uh, my buddy Andy Stearns. Um, we are coming to cold foot. And there I am, under the pipeline. The pipeline, by the way, offers no shelter. It seems to promise shelter from different things, but it's no shelter against rain. Nothing against snow, nothing against wildlife. Um, one thing it's great for is throwing your parachute cord over, pulling your food up and compact your bag, tying it off, feeling nice and secure, put your foods up there. So a lot of thunderstorms, especially up north, um, north there at Circle, there were quite a few, and they were awesome. Once lightning struck right near me and Anna, and Kristen and my cousin, yeah, we heard the stab pops and stuff. It did feel some extreme heat. This was the hottest day as I was descending toward the Selcha River. 
and I think even those those thermometers are historically badly inaccurate. I thought that was probably close. It was probably 90 that day. Anyways, it was a hot one. This was not a hot one. <laughs> this was mid Alaska range, and uh, we had my daughter Anna and her friend Sayla with us for nine days. And it was nine days of just terrible weather. It's like the weather you don't want to be out in. The weather you know you're going to get wet and you're not going to dry stuff out in. But of course, the adults were uh, freaking out and the kids were fine. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the prettiest parts on the whole trip. It's a little plateau that's four miles from the highway and it's between, um, it's near Family Creek. But it's, uh, you can send this little plateau, and it's like the Arctic all of a sudden. You got all these cool birds, like whimbrels up there, and it's all tundra, there's no trees up there. And you can send right back into the forest, it's sort of middle aspirin. And there are our girls again, that's Anna and Sayla, and you can see they're not dressed for 90 degrees. They're dressed for what we have. So on this trip, uh, I said I didn't see many people compared to 1997, which was every day I met a lot of people. But I did meet a lot of people on this trip too. Uh, is Anna still there? You're getting your signal. Okay. Your girl has my signal. So I met um, some of these guys. They were always pretty cool. Um, Alieska is the company, a consortium of oil companies that oil owns the pipeline, and uh, they hire contractors to do their security. These guys were always very cool to me. And eventually, I got way up there, and one guy told me, he said, Ned, we got a memo that said to be nice to you. <laughs> And these guys would always give me water and stuff. I always liked seeing them, but uh, up way north, I didn't see them at all. Uh, this guy's name is Doug Bowman, and I met him 20 years ago. And after I met him and golfed with him on his golf course he made on his five acre home site in the Cowper River Valley, that inspired me. I said, this could be a good book here. I uh, need more characters like him. And that's his daughter Taylor, and she's 19, so 20 years ago she was not there. <laughs> uh, these two dudes were bear hunting, and they tried to sort of Jesus convert me, but they gave me some coffee too. <laughs> and I said, thanks. This guy, I think his name is Roger, this was awesome. He's driving his 18 wheeler way up there on the Dalton Highway north of Hadigan Pass, and he stops, right in the middle of a major Alaska highway. He just stops the big rig. And he, uh, he knew of me, and he said, uh, yeah, I've been following your trip. And he gave me some muffins. And we were there about 10 minutes, and no traffic came whatsoever. Yeah, that's another theme. Less trucks in 20 years ago, more motorcycles. This is Judy Hicks. She let me and my family stay at Rika's Roadhouse. She works for worked for state parks in Delta and they closed on July 4th. This is David and Taryn who came up and gave me a Diet Coke with David's name on it and a box of food. That is the food box. I made 11 of those for north of Fairbanks. And uh, they brought one up to me. These are uh, the walkers, and they live down near Delta off Shaw Creek. They homesteaded 160 acres in the uh, early 60s, and I wrote about them in my book. 
And I got to the end of their drive, right where the Pogo Mine Road intersects the pipeline, and I knew it was theirs, but I didn't know that they were still around. They were like 60 then, it's 20 years later, I haven't kept in touch. Then I walked out, you know they were awesome. Uh, these guys are also in my book, they live at Copper Center, they got an awesome place there, I stayed there two days. <laughs> Saw this lovely lady run around in Wise Men. That's my wife, Kristen. This is Jillian. She lives in Coldfoot and she works uh, the Neural Elastic Tour Company. And she was awesome. She let me stay there and uh, use her internet. Oh, and this, I've been waiting to do this for years. Years this has been in the making. This is Ted, Ned, and Ed in a bed. <laughs> this is the Fresco Cables, our good buddies, and uh, great hikers. And there you see how steep it is north of Fairbanks, up, down, up, down. This is a family from Brazil. They're on the road for seven years. And they were up on the Dalton down there in Florida. That's my nephew and my friend John. This is Tony. Tony works for Northern Alaska Tour Company. And Northern Alaska Tour Company really helped me in North Fairbanks because they have these vans that come up every day, sometimes a couple days, a couple times a day. And I would give them I would text Michelle, who works there, up in my satellite text her, say, I need food box number seven in two days, and there would be Tony on the tundra <laughs> with my food box. That's cool. There's Clutch. Who knows Clutch? He lives in Esther a lot of the time, but he also lives in Wiseman in summer. It's my cousin from San Francisco. She came up, and Anna, and he left Anna gold pan and stuff. That's Andy. Andy got in the water. Who knows Andy? Everybody knows Andy, right? Andy's a 20 year ago veteran and he joined me again this year. And we took a bath in the Yukon. This is Knuth, works here at UAF. He was working on a project in Wiseman where he had collared links and snowshoe hair. And here we're looking for a snowshoe hair. I went along with him one day, because I happened to be in Wiseman at the same time. These folks live in Paradise, 46 Mile Richardson, which is a really beautiful park the highway just north of Valdez. And I saw them running on the highway. I hadn't seen people for a couple days, and they invited me in for coffee. There's my cousin from San Francisco, trying not to get hypothermia on a really great bad day, right at the base of Chandelier Shelf when we walked the muddy road all day. And that's the day that uh, she caught a right back civilization. <laughs> There's Eric getting mauled, Eric Troyer, taking a hit for the team. <laughs> There's Margaret Darrow and I believe his name is Sasha. They studied permafrost when me and Eric were hiking together. This was at mile 87. Scientists call it a retrogressive thaw slump, which is a terrible name for a big sinkhole. They happen a lot now in the Arctic, and that seems to be a change from uh, 20 years ago. I don't remember that one. There's Ian's sister. And they saved us at their cabin in the Alaska range in that terrible weather. There's a friend crossing Gunny Sack Creek. There are two buddies who caught me at mile two. They uh, I was almost done, headed toward the Hugo uh, Bay infrastructure. And I saw two people walking across the tundra at me. And I thought one was Jana because she worked there. I said, who don't know the station? Oh. But it was uh, Becky, 
who I've done river trips with, and uh, Sean, who's a uh, got a good wheels on the softball team. So they were both there. <laughs> And there's a 10 year old. Okay, 20 years is a long time, right? Seems like a long time, but the older you get, the shorter it seems, right? How much change we see in 20 years? Let's see. There's a Heartland cover. Mike Mathers took this photo in 97. That's when me and Eric were there. And that is comparison. <coughs> We were just looking at this with Sabrina, and uh, the shrubby areas aren't too much shrubbier, are they? It looks kind of very similar, very similar for 20 years. There's the white on, one on the right is older, right? Uh, there's it's about a Galbert Lake looking back toward the mountains. You see that glacier? Who knows the name of that glacier? It's only a tulip that I forgot. Gates. What? Gates. Gates, very good, thank you. Gates Glacier, there's comparison, 20 years apart. It's a little smaller, right? Rod? Might be fresh snow up here too, but looks smaller to me. There's my buddy Andy Stearns, 20 years ago, doing Hot Cat Hill. This is the steepest part. Jeff, could you ride down this? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. What's your opinion? <laughs> you wobbled there, you hesitated. No, you didn't. You didn't at all. There's Andy again, he just happened to be there for the same portion. Yeah. It's a little more vegetative, but it's still pretty steep. <laughs> it's hard to walk down. Who's been to the hot spot? No, we've got a hamburger up there. A few. A few. You know, Trees is up there. Used to be Trees and Dean up there, but they're divorced now. But it was Teresa and Dean here 20 years ago. And there's Teresa now. And uh, yeah, I was there and I was having my burger. And John was there too. And he was there 20 years ago with me. And I knew I had that picture of her on my iPad, the old one. So I pulled it out. She said, oh, I'll get right back in that window. <laughs> and she did. So I got <laughs> 20 year comparison. Your comparisons, there's my, uh, my buddy Jane. Or a same spot, pretty much. It doesn't look like it's changed too much. The dogs change. There's me. This is uh, that line going up is the pipeline going up to the top of Keystone Canyon. Quite steep indeed. It's right by uh, the low river in Valdez. Here I am. A couple months ago, Ian Carlson took that photo. Knuckles. Yeah. There's comparison. This picture of me Mathers took in '97. There's me. <laughs> the Anna took this picture at the start. There's my self portrait at, at the end. So here we are. Okay. <clears throat> Enough about us humans. Cora, come. Come. You can let her go in. Let her go. Here's the star of the show. So, you can imagine. If I'm walking 850, this dog's walking 1,000, right? <laughs> Easy. What was her high moment, you ask? I don't know. Maybe it was being surrounded by all these co-eds at Tulip Lake. We went up there. Uh, they invited us in. Tulip Field Station is a research place run by the Institute of Arc Biology. And it's uh, really cool. We did a lot of neat projects up there and great, great food. Uh, <laughs> this is like the beef tips that Cora was eating there. Um, um, 
It's more on somebody's lap right now. Because <laughs> she really likes to be in people's laps. In fact, if you made a lap, she was pretty much <laughs> she was pretty much in it. <laughs> Whether you wanted or not, most people seem to want by the end. But um, it's like Eric said, he wasn't a big. His family thinks he's not a big dog guy. From what I saw out there, he's, he's the biggest dog lover. You know. So it wasn't all uh, an easy trip for um, a creature like that. Yeah, remember that picture of Tony delivering the food box on the tundra? That's what was on Tony, too. That was that same day. Remember that, Eric? I think it was a girl. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the breeze had stopped. So. But, what the heck? They all like that. And this dog was free all summer long to. Uh, to chase whatever she wanted. What kind of grouse is that? Who knows? Is that a sharp tail? I don't know, I'm just asking. It was pretty far south to that snow. Because it doesn't look like a spruce grouse to me. Anyway, she got to chase them all day long. She got to chase ravens all day long. Got to chase white front of keys when they were available. This guy walked right up on us. And uh, I was ashamed of myself because I thought I had this great radar built in. I said, I'm not seeing any bears because I'm just alert and I can see him coming. But that caribou walked to within 10 feet of me. I didn't know it was there. <laughs> on gravel, looking along gravel. <laughs> But Cora, she's, uh, one command she knows is wrong. Not no, but wrong. People are always tell dogs and kids no, right? So I told her wrong here, and she didn't chase. I'm very proud of that moment. And... <laughs> that one I said, come. She uh, came to me and not the, not the bull. So we did have one incident out there, and uh, if you are uh, squeamish about wildlife encounters, you might not want to look at this next slide. But we did get charged once. <laughs> Yeah, I think that rabbit's in heaven now. Where'd you do that rabbit for? No, I think he got away. Most of them got away. But not all. Anyway, I took about 800 shots of uh, pipeline graffiti still there from 40 years ago. The pipe itself is 40 years old. So have a nice one. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's the end of my slides. Sneakers that don't give you uh, 
blisters. And I wore hiking boots to Delta. So my God, I had wings on my feet when I put these on. And I don't see the case for hiking boots anymore. Right? They just clamp around your ankle, make your feet hot, make them sweat. Do you really need that support? Some people think maybe, but I don't think I We should talk about all the bears. Yes, how many bears did I see, Eric? I only saw two bears. They're both been in the last week or so. Eric and I saw a grizzly on the tundra. And then the next night, if you recall, Eric, we were sleeping by the Saginaw Burp Truck in the river. We had two tents. Cora got up and she was sniffing like the fresh air vent in the tent and uh, started growling. So I let her out. She started tearing toward Eric's tent and barking real loud. And we had our food over a pipeline mileage sign, mile 76, but it was really hot. We had to use a pallet to get a bag of food out there. And the next day we saw grizzly tracks by that, so perhaps she was chasing it off. Yeah. And then the last night, yeah, I was 10 miles out. I just drank my last cup of tea, ready to go to bed for the last time, kind of melancholy, the trip's about to end. And there's a, a brown smudge on the tundra, and it was a bear. And so I wanted to get that bear's attention, because it was getting closer. So I took a rock, went over to the vertical support member's field, clang, 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 clang. And it looked at us, and it wandered off. So, Cord never even knew it was there. So that was it. Two bears. That's my theory, hey? We were uh, having dinner with Cat Better. She says, we know like seven people who've been attacked by bears. If not attacked, at least had a really bad encounter with bears. I thought, wow, that's that's a high percentage to have uh, that many people you know, you know, have that many interactions. And I think, okay, I was out for 120 days first time, 96 days this time, pretty much zero of those. And I think having that dog is probably the main deal. That walking an industrial <laughs> path, perhaps. Ian Carlson. Question. Would you walk the pipeline without any dog, like no Cora? You know, I don't think it would be as much fun. Yeah, that was part of the part of my fun was watching her go around, run around, have fun every day, free, untethered. Yes, and we. Ever thought about doing it in winter? Yeah, Jeff Oakley told me to do it in the winter so I could be back to play softball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can ski in. I don't know, it's so steep, punchy. It wouldn't be a good ski. It wouldn't be a good bike. It wouldn't be a good walk. I don't know. It's just, it's best just on foot, I think. That's the best way to do that whole route. There'd be spots to be great to ski. There'd be spots to be great to bike. Did you ever have to eat like MREs or other types of instant food when you were going? Oh yeah, it was all instant food, man. That's what I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> when the kitchen's all trash at night from making five course meals, like I just want to throw away my bag and <laughs> eat my spoon and put it back. <laughs> That's what I want. Your your special spoon. My special spoon that I once walked back two miles for after adding four miles to my total. But yeah, that was simplicity. Yeah, so it was all dry food. All we needed was boiling water. And you dump it in your pouch. And you had, you know, breakfast is like oatmeal, so yeah. It was just that water living. You didn't mention the consequence of the possible bear and near bear encounter when Cora went tearing out of the tent. Oh yeah, what would be the consequence here? Your air mattress? Oh yeah. Yeah, where's my wife? <laughs> I still haven't replaced that for you. You know those new air mattresses? They're uh, really flimsy, but they're awesome. It's like a beach toy too. So it's an air mattress. Thing. You see what? So we have a real light one. I dated it the whole way. And then, yeah, it's right back pump station too. Cora thought she heard something, and that was her takeoff point, was the magic. And there was like a 
a shotgun blast. And <laughs> then it was like a four inch gash that was pretty much unfixable. We tried in the field, I failed. And it's a lovely place to get. That pack didn't want to take more than 40 pounds, so I tried to keep it under there. That was the manufacturer's recommendation. Keep it under three. Did you have any negative people interacting? Yeah, the guy who owns Grizzly Pizza in the Copper River Valley. He didn't like dogs. He thought I had a car. It was a misunderstanding. <laughs> yes, Andrew. Uh, if you were really hustling, how fast do you think you'd be? You accuse me of lack of hustle? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying. If you were really trying, you're in your car. You're running home. Oh, you could, uh, that would be a good way to do it. How fast could that fast be? Right. Bob could knock it out. He could do 20 miles a day. You guys are good at math. 800 miles, 20 miles a day. What is that? A month and 10 days? 40 days? He'd do it 30 miles. That's how Bob would do it. And then he'd get bored with 20 mile days and start doing 40s. He would, uh, if you're wondering about uh, Ned's lack of hustle, when the first morning I got up and got ready, kind of leisurely, and 10.30 when we were getting ready to go, kind of 10.30, and Ned looked at me and said, this is the earliest I've ever started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we didn't shoot on the gates too often. Did you lose yes. weight on the trip? I think so. Not too much, maybe uh, three or four pounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, walk. what's that? Do you prefer to walk uh, evening or morning? Yeah, you know, 20 years ago I walked till like one or two in the morning sometimes, just because that's such a nice time of day. But it's also when the mosquitoes are out, so I try to. I was really mosquito driven all the way through the interior. I know people say it wasn't a bad year here, but along that route you hit a lot of swamp. In fact, it would be impassable without that gravel, that pile of gravel, that 800 mile long pile of gravel. Couldn't do it. Yeah, especially uh, up north. Or here in the interior. Swamp after swamp. So you had a lot of time by yourself. Did you uh you had a lot of time to think? Did you compose your next great novel or <laughs> No, no, I just daydream mostly. Yeah. Don't get much productive done. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.